Yani Ahmet'le mi istemiş bu yer? Ahmet mi istemiş? Ben o zaman ondan bir şey yapayım. USB'yi de buraya mı alıyoruz abi? Şurada bak. Görüyor musun? Ha, tamam. Şurada. Şöyle yapıp. So you just have to go to the desktop. It's all here. Okay. It's open. Yours is here. Okay. See? And that was the one I sent this morning. Yes. Okay. Yes. Sorry, maybe you got. I hope it. <laughs> it won't <laughs> be an one. F5. F5. F5 makes it a uh, full screen. Full screen. And now you can use the clicker. Great. Yok yok var hepsi burada. Şu istiyorsan çıkıp şuraya basarsan seninki şurada. Buna basıp sonra clicker'ı kullanabilirsin. Evet. Üstüne gelip daha sonra burada 5. F5'e basarsan full screen oluyor tamam mı? Sonra escape'e basarsan çıkmış oluyor. Tamam. Şimdi sen yapacağın zaman bunu yaparsın.
Good morning. Distinguished guests, colleagues, and friends. Thank you all uh, for joining us in the Young Scholars in Turkey Conference of 2013. My name is Erol Cebeci, and I'm the executive director of the Seda Foundation at Washington, D.C. As most of you already know, Young Scholars on Turkey program aims to deepen the policy debates on Turkey by engaging and collaborating with the academics working on Turkey. It is often the case that the academic world's engagement with the policy, with the policy world basically, is minimal and sometimes non-existent in many cases. We think that the distance between academics and policy analysts working on Turkey is especially large. By providing a unique opportunity to social scientists to engage the policy community, we hope that this conference will help bridge that gap. As the SETA Foundation, we are dedicated to furthering the level of understanding and depth of discussion on US-Turkey relations and Turkish foreign policy. We consider this conference one of the ways to accomplish this objective. We also hope to contribute to the diversity of voices and analytical perspectives on Turkey. In today's conference, you will be presented with some fascinating papers that deal with a variety of issues on both domestic and foreign policy. We were very pleased with the attention to the call of papers for this conference. We have received submissions from academics in Turkey, in different parts of Europe, North Africa, and the United States. The level of response reflects Turkey's increased profile, and we are pleased that there is now a, a whole new generation of scholars all over the world working on issues related to Turkey. I'm confident that you will find the presentations thoughtful and informative. And we also would love to hear from you in terms of your feedback on this conference for us to improve this program further. The Young Scholars on Turkey Conference of 2011 resulted in the publication of an edited volume titled History, Politics, and Foreign Policy in Turkey. And the book was edited by my predece predecessor, Nuh Yilmaz, Kılıç Kanat, and Kadir Istun, and was published by Seda Foundation. I believe we have some copies available at the registration de desk, and we hope to publish a similar volume out of today's conference presentation in the coming months. As you can find in the printed conference program and the files that are on the tables, we will have three panels today and a keynote address during the lunch break. The, the first panel will address some of the domestic issues, while the second and third panels will with deal with the foreign policy issues. Given that SETA, DC especially focuses mostly on Turkish foreign policy and US-Turkey relations. That is how we decided those three panels. During the lunch break, we will be honored to host the world-renowned economist and the former minister of economics in Turkey, Honorable Kemal Dervish of Brookings Institution and Sabancı University. And I want to take this opportunity to thank him for accepting to deliver the keynote address today. 
I have no intention of prolonging uh, this uh, speech, but I would like to thank all of the panelists and the discussants for their hard work and their participation. And I would like to thank my team uh, for their efforts who put this conference together and make it a unique program. I especially want to thank our research director, Director Kadir Rüstün, the research director at SARA DC, and Kılıç Kanat and Ahmet Selim Tekeloğlu, who are the research fellows at SARA DC for making this program happen. I also would like to thank Ömer Özbek, who is our managing director, and Maggie Simon, and our new intern, uh, um, Madeline, uh, for their entire support in organizing this conference. Please enjoy the conference. Thank you. Thank you so much, and welcome again. Uh, so we'll uh, head off and start right away. Uh, we'll try to wrap up the session uh, right on time so that we have enough time to prepare the room for the keynote address. Uh, so we have a wonderful panel ahead. Um, we have one person, Hassan Vural, who is not here yet. Uh, we'll see, uh, but it's a wonderful panel. Uh, so we'll start off with Ahmed Görgen and Don uh, Eshkinat and then Dr. Gavrilis, who was kind enough to join us today as a discussant. We'll have time. Uh, I don't have a taking time bob graph to show all of you, but uh, we'll keep it on time. So every speaker will have 15 to 20 minutes. We'll arrange as we go. Um, so, and I'll introduce the speakers uh, as we go. So first, uh, we have Ahmed Görgen from Yusuf Liebig University of Gießen. Uh, Ahmed Görgen is a PhD candidate in the Institute of Political Science um, at Yusuf Liebig. Uh, and uh, his research interests include uh, the social transformation in modern Turkey, the role of public intellectuals, state civil society relations, and the effect of Turkey's social transformation on the Arab Spring, uh, and largely Turkish foreign policy. Uh, so, Mr. Uh, Görgen, please, uh, if you wish to continue from here. Uh, yeah, so before we start, though, let me announce uh, the wireless network ID. Uh, for those of you who need, it's NPC Wi-Fi. The name and the password is wireless for with the digit free and PC. So for those of you who can see, wireless for free and PC. National Press Club. Yeah? Okay. Uh, okay, so Ahmed, if So first of all, I would like to thank to SETA Foundation for inviting me to here in this conference. My presentation topic is uh, social transformation in modern Turkey and analysis on the role of public intellectuals in the post 1980s. As many of you know that there has been a social transformation after the 1980s in Turkey. So I am focusing on what was the roles of public intellectuals in this process. I will cover in my presentation that a research process and a state of the art what has been said before on the, this topic and theoretical framework of uh, my project and sources and methodology that I used. Intellectual thought in Turkey since the Ottoman Empire, which is the historical background uh, of public intellectuals in Turkey and pluralist public intellectuals in the media from the 1980s onwards is uh, how pluralist public intellectuals is emerged in this process and application of research uh, findings and debate and public intellectuals and social transformation in Turkey from the 1980s onwards is the findings uh, on the role of public intellectuals and how was the orientation of people in this process and mapping the process 
how my findings and theory are met together and a conclusion. Research process include a research question, which is what is the role of pluralist public intellectuals in the process of social transformation in Turkey from the 1980s onwards? So at the end of my research, my hypothesis emerge like pluralist public intellectuals brought the country's social problems onto the agenda with a role of convincing people of the need uh, for uh, social transformation and motivating the governments to create a new political system. So I would like to explain what is the concept of pluralist public intellectuals. So I am focusing on newly emerged public intellectuals after the 1980s. I have called them as pluralists because of their idea to create a pluralist society in Turkey. The uh, state of the art uh, include uh, a historical and social uh, dimensions of public intellectuals. So I categorized these uh, uh, research before me in four groups. So first of all, historical and social dimensions of the public intellectuals include uh, the concept of Louis Bodin, which uh, he argues that after, uh, after the 20th century, a new uh, intellectual class are emerge, and uh, for him, intellectual activity is a general situation. In relation with this, Raymond Aaron is analyzing that public intellectuals are seeking the political power to design the society. Also, Jürgen Habermas, in relation with this, uh, arguing that public intellectuals are constructing the public discourse of power for the important subjects of the society. Secondly, culture producers category include the concept of Sabri Ulgener, which he analyzed that public intellectuals are recognized on the basis of their functions in the society. In relation with this, Errol Mutlu is analyzing uh, after the 1980s of Turkey that uh, there has been a mediatization in public intellectuals and they were effective to convince uh, the ordinary people. Thirdly, class-based analysis include uh, most importantly the concept of Antonio Gramsci, which uh, he analyzed uh, that uh, public intellectuals has an organic link to some social classes. So that's why they are organic and working for the interests of these uh, social classes. And it links to the concept of Tanil Bora in Turkey because he is linking being organic concept to some political parties and he argues that uh, public intellectuals are influencing the ordinary people for the interests of the political parties. Lastly, the dissident and radical critical intellectuals category is including the concept of Jan Paul Sartre. And for him, uh, intellectuals are workers for a universal design and they are always critical. Secondly, Edward Said, is uh, analyzing that public intellectuals are working against the government to say the truth. And lastly, the concept of uh, Jamil marriage on public intellectuals include that he is arguing intellectuals has a sense of responsibility and they know the values and ideas of the people. There are many limitations in uh, existing research on my topic. I am uh, showing here only three most important them. Previous analysis uh, didn't include on how pluralist public intellectuals have evolved in Turkey from the 1980s onwards. Secondly, in their analysis, the function of media for public intellectuals for interacting with the people was not clear. And thirdly, the role of public intellectuals on social transformation in Turkey from the 1980s onwards was not seen in their analysis. As you see in the uh, blue balls, I have constructed my theory starting by Jürgen Habermas because of the uh, public discourse, they are creating public discourse of power. And uh, it links to the Raymond Aaron because public intellectuals are looking for a political power to design, uh, to design the society in his analysis. Then it links to Errol Mutlu <coughs> uh, because uh, he is explaining how public intellectuals are linked to media to influence the people. As you see in the bottom, 
I linked to Antonio Gramsci uh, because of uh, linking uh, orga intellectuals with an organic link to the uh, some social classes. And then it links to the Tanil Bora in terms of the political party's interest. And all meet in the center with the concept of Jamil marriage because what Jamil marriage was expecting from an intellectual was seen in pluralist public intellectuals after the 1980s. Like they know the values and ideas of their uh, or, uh, people and they act according to these ideas. So I used sources as uh, my sources are reports, official documents and conducted interviews with the most important pluralist public intellectuals in Turkey. For instance, Professor Nilüfer Merli from Bahçeşehir University and Professor Sedat Laçiner from Çanakkale 18 Mart University and uh, columnists Fehmi Koru and Ahmet Altan and Foreign Minister of Turkey, Professor Ahmet Davutoğlu. Also, I used books and articles from the journals. I used qualitative research method. Firstly, I used ground theory, which was uh, developed by Barney Glazer and Anselm Strauss. Secondly, I use uh, Carla Willig's version of Foucauldian discourse analysis for analyzing the interviews. If we see the historical background, first of all, intellectuals emerge, uh, Western style intellectuals emerge in the uh, Ottoman Empire with the Tanzimat period, which is called Ottoman reform. So in that period, Westernization of Ottoman Empire has started. And uh, with the idea of Ottomanism, uh, Ottoman nations started to be unified uh, under Ottoman Empire. And in that period, public intellectuals were literate and uh, they were in a ruling class and separate from the society. And later on, Ottomanism lost power in Ottoman society. Then uh, Pan-Turkism became the major ideology. Then uh, Pan-Turkist uh, people, Pan-Turkist ruling class in Ottoman Empire, mainly uh, the was the founder of Republic of Turkey. So uh, this, uh, the Republic of Turkey was the modernization from above. So the ruling class in Ottoman Empire, also elites and uh, some uh, separate people from society was the founder of uh, Republic of Turkey. And uh, in the first years of Turkey, social formation based on Turkish nationalism. And uh, in that period, intellectuals worked for the official uh, national identity. And until 1980s in Turkey, Kemalists were, uh, uh, intellectuals were elites and they got the uh, ideology of Kemalism. And uh, there was a competition between intellectuals and ordinary people, and people did not accept the idea of the public intellectuals, and uh, public intellectuals were, were not dealing with the ideas of the uh, people as well. State used in that period the spread of nationalism, mainly in Anatolia, against to the communist threat in the uh, Cold War period. And in 1980, we had an uh, military coup. This military coup changed the economy policy of Turkey from import substitution growth to export oriented growth. So this affected that uh, to have some privatization in state and uh, we saw private TV channels and private mass communication tools as well. <coughs> and uh, the increase in education level in Anatolia caused to uh, have new uh, public intellectuals as well in this period. So they were pluralist public intellectuals and uh, they came uh, with uh, different social backgrounds. And uh, they had easily connected to ordinary people because of they know these ideas. In 1990s, these uh, p uh, pluralist public intellectuals became organic and uh, they influenced some uh, political parties for the formation of some governments. However, this is understood as the threat to the uh, system of Turkey by the military. So we had a 1997 military uh, memorandum in Turkey, which is uh, called 28 February process as well. 
Uh, at the end, these affected the people and pluralist public intellectuals to meet in the center. <coughs> uh, so they have regrouped and aimed to change uh, some uh, political uh, issues in terms of the uh, pluralization of society and state. And there was a clash, uh, a competition between Kemalists and uh, Kemalists and pluralist public intellectuals. As we see the application of research in terms of the pluralist public intellectuals, pluralist public intellectuals conceptualized the ideas of the people. Uh, in their analysis, there was a demand for broader national identity, and uh, they had they wanted to have a multi-dimensional domestic and foreign policy. <coughs> for instance, the most important example is uh, Foreign Minister of Turkey, Ahmet Davutoğlu's concept, strategic debt. Because in strategic debt, you can find all uh, social and international relations uh, background uh, of the ideas of people. So this is a kind of conceptualized version of the ideas of people. And uh, in this period, uh, public intellect, pluralist public intellectuals interacted with the people via political parties, groups, and communities. And with the uh, 2000s, uh, social media, they used social media as well for interacting. So they were following uh, people and public intellectuals were following each other in social media. And they shaped the social and political agenda. They convinced the people of the need for social transformation and motivated the governments to create a new political system. In terms of the orientation of people, Public opinion polls in Turkey shows that uh, people tend to secure their Muslim identity while being a part of the developments in the world. Secondly, the idea of people is uh, a kind of back to the multi-ethnic Ottoman social structure. So they are accepting um, more uh, ethnic groups or much more broader identity in state. And elections are showing the political preference of the people as well. First of all, in 1980s and 1990s, people searched for the alternatives to eliminate the effect of 1980 coup in Turkey. And secondly, Recep Tayyip Erdogan's Justice and Development Party has been formed in 2001 and obtained the votes of 34% uh, in 2003, 46% in 2007, and uh, 2011, uh, uh, 49% in 2011. So this is showing how people are supportive on the reforms which is made by AK Party. And 58% uh, of uh, yes votes of people to the Turkish constitutional referendum is also showing how people uh, has uh, social transformation and want to transform the state as well. If we uh, analyze the media, the role of media in that period in terms of the public intellectuals, so free media brought the freedom of fr free ideas of the people in Turkey. <coughs> and in these uh, media groups, uh, political discussion programs mainly seen by the people, and they were followed uh, when uh, ordinary people got some ideas, they have shared with some people in their community so this step-by-step step extended the idea of transformation in society. If you see the mapping the process, how my theory and findings are met, I don't like to explain again uh, the theoretical background because of the lack of time. Uh, just I will talk about findings. If you see the yellow balls, uh, freedom on culture and ideas brought the new identity formation in Turkey. And if you see in brown balls in the middle, power and interest both in uh, pluralist public intellectuals and the ordinary people caused to have a social interaction both within people and between people and pluralist public intellectuals. And this uh, created a social reality in society which demand for a social transformation. I if you see in bottom uh, gray balls, economic, historical, and religious background of the people uh, shape the policy preferences of people in this process. As a conclusion, pluralist public intellectuals had the role to convince the ordinary people 
in terms of the need for social transformation and governments have been formed in line with the pluralist public intellectuals perspective. <coughs> Secondly, the social process on the social transformation in Turkey from the 1980s onwards continued with the opening of Kurdish TV channels, Armenian programs and granting political representation for the different uh, ethnic and religious groups. Also, effectiveness of women within society and the construction of nationality have been changing from being a Turk to be a citizen of Turkey. Lastly, pluralist public intellectuals mainly gave reference to the Ottoman social structure and showed that the impossibility of the creation of a single nationality on multi-ethnic legacy of Ottoman Empire and the common beliefs of the people caused to shape a new social structure with the effect of them. Since the last decade, the number of TV programs and research ab about the Ottoman system and social structure of the Ottoman Empire has increased. In this sense, the new social structure has included the Ottoman dimension as well. In foreign policy, it created an effect that Turkey should deal with the former Ottoman regions. So uh, thank you very much for your attention. I will be happy to hear your comments and questions. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Amit. Uh, so, okay, next we have Doğan Eşkinat, uh, and that was, by the way, uh, the time uh, thing. Uh, and Doğan, would you like to speak there? Yeah. yeah. Uh, so Doğan Eşkinat is actually one of our own. Uh, he's a research assistant uh, in at SETA Foundation uh, in Ankara, uh, and he is working at the, um, at the political studies desk over there covering um, issues that's in his uh, research interests, which includes political parties, democratization, and particularly leftist, leftist politics. Uh, and we are joined by Hassan Rao, by the way, uh, which is good, which means we are back to the 15 minutes plan. Uh, Doan, please. Thank you. Um, first of all, let me thank uh, Sara Dissi for organizing this event. It's a home away from home. And uh, like, I really appreciate the hospitality. Uh, today I'll talk to you about uh, the Republican People's Party. Um, first, let me explain why that's important. Um, so far, the uh, Justice and Development Party's um, tenure focused on deconstructing certain less democratic habits in the country. That most prominently, that was the um, civil military relations and the um, overall influence that the military enjoyed over civilian politics. As of 2011, we have a new discussion at hand. What's next? What's the next challenge? How do we engage in a constructive process? Uh, November 3rd, 2012 marked the 10 year anniversary of the Justice and Development Party's rise to power. Uh, over the past decade, the Republican People's Party emerged as the principal actor that dominated the country's previously fragmented center opposition. During this period, the RPP almost exclusively appealed to secularist and leftist concerns um, about an Islamist party's assertion of itself as the country's new, new government. Due to the Justice and Development Party's unrivaled um, position in Turkish politics, most analyses of the country's ongoing transformation tend to focus on the ruling party, and understandably so. Nonetheless, it is clear that democratic consolidation necessitates some degree of support from across the political spectrum, and most significantly, movements that are in the political center. As such, a look into the ways in which a decade of justice and development party rule affected the Republican People's Party and its policies represents a meaningful endeavor to correctly assert the resilience of Turkey's democrat democratization efforts and the prospects of democratic consolidation. First, a little bit of history. One of the reasons that the Republican People's Party matters for democratic consolidation in Turkey is due to its heritage that goes back to the very foundation um, of the Republic and the founding elite. Established in 1923, 
the original RPP made its mark on the country's 90-year history. Between 1923 and 1946, the party created the single party system in the spirit of the period and embarked on an authoritarian reform project that witnessed government intervention in and regulation of virtually all its aspects of life, including clothing, music, culture. In the aftermath of the Second World War, the party oversaw the transition into a multi-party democracy that ushered in a decade of democratic party rule after the first free and fair elections in 1950. Despite the RPP's inability to replace the DP through popular elections, the military overthrow of the Republic's first democratically elected government in 1960 instituted a so-called protected democracy, where a series of newly introduced public institutions were entrusted um, with the duty to oversee and restrict the power of elected governments to influence policy. Perhaps not surprisingly, the 1961 constitution shared many principles with a Republican, party, uh, Republican People's Party proposal published months before the coup. However, the party's lack of success against political successors of the Democratic Party continued through, throughout the 1960s. Consequently, a group of social democrats formed an inter-party opposition to pressure the party administration into developing a center-left program to attract the country's emerging urban um, working class. The resulting transformation manifested itself in the form of the left of center democratic left agenda under the leadership of Brante Jevit, the first civilian to rule the party, and led the Republicans to two consecutive victories in 1973 and 77. However, the 1980 military coup put an abrupt end to the party's continued lineage since Mustafa Kemal Atatürk, the Republic's founder and national hero. The current Republican People's Party that we discuss in this paper was established in 1992 following the parliament's decision to lift the military instituted ban on pre-coup political parties. By this point, a number of new political parties traced their heritage um, to the pre-1980 Republican People's Party, including Ejevit's Democratic Left Party and the Social Democratic Populist Party. Two developments in the 1990s reestablished the monopoly of the Republican People's Party over this political tradition. In 1995, the Social Democrats merged with the Republicans, while the Democratic Left Party of Ejevit lost all credibility due to political turmoil and the most severe financial crisis in the country's um, history during its short-lived coalition government between 1999 and 2002. As such, the Republican People's Party became the main opposition party from 2000 onwards, and that is the situation today. Now the question is, given its historic association with the Republic's power elite, what does the Republican People's Party represent vis-a-vis -vis Turkey's ongoing efforts to consolidate its democracy? Although most approaches um, to democratic transitions across the world uh, focus on structural explanations, we must formulate a perspective that takes into account the ways in which individual players in the game of parliamentary politics interact with, shape, and are influenced by um, structural changes in the rules of the game. Against the background of recent developments in Turkey's civil military relations, I posit that a three-step model best explains contemporary developments and um, future trends in democratic consolidation in Turkey. First, civilian victory in contestations um, with the military, over the military's oversight of civilian politics, led to a new power equilibrium whereby the military effectively suspended its intervention in political debates. As such, the tutelage system's um, weakening reaff reaffirms um, the role of free and fair elections as the exclusive means to accumulate political power. As a matter of fact, a new development that happened today, a Republican People's Party uh, deputy, currently in parliament, was quoted in today's news reports as saying, I quote, there, there used to be military coups, now there is no such salvation. The only salvation left is the ballot box, unquote. Second, former allies slash proponents of the tutelage regime reassess political costs and benefits and opt to 
alter their behavior toward democratization efforts in order to maximize their individual performance as having established the elections monopoly over politics, that's the only way left to, to influence the country's policies. Finally, the former regime allies' support for democratization efforts both boost the new order's legitimacy among the agenda's former opponents and realigns the reformed opposition as a positive incentive toward further democratization. In line with this three-step model, the Republican People's Party's decade-long tenure during the um, Justice and Development Party period, um, as Turkey's main opposition may be divided into three distinct periods. First, the party positioned itself as an ally of the military bureaucratic tutelage system until the 2007 elections, at a time when the establishment approached the Justice and Development Party government as an Islamist agent with a secret agenda to overthrow the Second Republic. In the meanwhile, the Republican People's Party based its entire political platform on the establishment's threat perceptions. So they challenged the EU accession process that restricted the military's power over um, civilian politics and developed a strong language that fueled fears about an Islamist takeover and Western support for Kurdish separatism. In the meanwhile, these attitudes um, crystallized during the 2007 presidential crisis when the establishment strongly responded to Abdullah Gül's endor endorsement by the Justice and Development Party. These included the military command's April 2007 press release emphasizing their constitutional mandate to safeguard the secular order, uh, the constitutional court's May 2007 decision to annul um, the first round of presidential vote in the parliament. The following early elections called by the government established the Republicans' party as the de facto party of the secular opposition. During this period, the Republican position was so contradictory to global principles of left politics that the Socialist International actually threatened to review the party's membership status during its 23rd Congress in 2008. This was, a, this was the first period. The second period witnessed some gradual reform efforts. In, well, following the civilian government's victory over, over the military, in September um, 2008, the party established an office in Brussels to boost the party's rela relations with the European Union. Another important development at this point was the so-called Burka Initiative, whereby the party leadership publicly admitted Burka-wearing women as members to challenge their, their popular view as um, strong seculars. The third period, witnessed cont constant contestation between the old party elite, whose vision of opposition involves non-participation in the democratization process, and the new party elite, whose eagerness and um, bold statements against the party's state-oriented political tradition created a cre crisis of legitimacy for the new leadership. In the face of two competing political agendas within the party, the current leadership embraced a balance of power policy whereby both groups have been publicly criticized in a futile attempt to develop a mildly reformist middle ground. Frequently, the two camps could not be reconciled, including regarding the most recent um, debates on the Kurdish questions and uh, democratization reforms, where the old elites strongly criticized the process as a hidden agenda to, to disintegrate the country, whereas the new elite was very much in favor of these reform, reforms and criticized the party for not um, tagging along. At this time, the Republican People's Party is in the process of negotiating its new identity. The old and new party elites continue to swing party politics their way through controversial statements, public challenges, and factionalism. While it remains to be seen which group will eventually succeed in their efforts, the outcome is bound to have repercussions beyond the Republican People's Party. The party will either succeed in its efforts to reposition itself along the new rules of the game and develop a party platform that promotes greater liberties and democracy, 
or it will retreat to its old ways and thereby compromise its crucial role as a representative of the Turkish left in the country's political center. Thank you, Brian. Perfect. Uh, we are on time. Just before we go ahead, for those of you who joined us late, uh, the wireless network is the ID and PC Wi-Fi, and the password is wireless, digit four, free, and PC. Uh, okay, so next we have Hassan Ral uh, from Ankara University. Uh, he is a lecturer at Faculty of Political Sciences at Ankara University, where he teaches constitutional law and compared to government. Um, he's an affiliate of the Human Rights Center at the university as well. Uh, and his title is Two Generations of Debate on Freedom of Religion in Turkey. Good Thank morning, you. everybody. Um, sorry, I've been late. Uh, I have to excuse me. Uh, today I will be briefly talking about uh, some kind of classification we can make in analyzing the public debate on freedom of religion in Turkey. I was conducting a research for a PhD dissertation on the constitutional protection of freedom of religion, and this uh, was a part of it. Uh, so uh, I will uh, try to make it uh, brief and clear. The public debate on freedom of religion in Turkey, we can trace it back to the 1940s. Uh, not before that, because since 1925, due to the uh, Silence Act of Takriri Sukun uh, uh, law, there was no real public debate until uh, 1944, which was the beginning of the democratization of Turkish political system after the Second World War. Uh, so uh, since then, we can uh, see ups and downs, uh, but a constant debate on freedom of religion. Uh, apart from the public uh, dimension, we can see a scholarly dimension in the debate too, uh, which for my own uh, perspective, in which a constitutional law uh, is a significant part, and uh, jurists and judges uh, have contributions in it. Uh, students of constitutional law uh, has contributed uh, in several significant ways, and the uh, Turkish judges, especially the higher courts uh, and the famous constitutional court after 1961, uh, has contributed to the debate. Uh, I'm trying to make a dual distinction, uh, and then I'm uh, going to try to make uh, it to come to a conclusion for the close future. But first, if we go to the background very briefly, uh, in the whole uh, social transformation, which we can uh, call modernization in Turkey, which uh, goes back to about three centuries, uh, we can identify three basic uh, directions of social change, which is directly related to the issue at, uh, at the table now, which are secularization, Muslimization, and democratization. Secularization is almost done, so let's pass it by. I mean is well discussed and well studied, and everybody uh, has uh, a good grasp of it now. But wha what about Muslimization? Uh, what do I mean with Muslimization? First, it is about demographics. A uh, hundred years ago, we had in Turkey a population of about 40% of non-Muslims, and uh, today it is less than 1%. So demographically, the country has become a Muslim country. And the Muslim population in Turkey become Muslimized, let me say. And what, that, what do I mean? I mean this. Uh, a modern orthodoxy produced by a force of public service and uh, also modern university teaching and civil society uh, actors uh, who put their efforts in parallel with them has uh, that all resulted in a kind of a new modern uh, Muslim uh, understanding which prevailed. I mean, uh, I can go uh, in further detail if you need later. And 
the country ha- i mean the third the third change which we have to uh, go um, which we have to look at now is democratization because um, both both mm, dimensions of democratization i mean the representative uh, principle and the liberties principles both of them uh, became established uh, in the course of the last uh, 60 years. So it, it changed uh, the dynamics that can affect uh, the politics of freedom of religion. Um, so let me identify the two generations now. The first one emerged immediately after 1944 when Turkey started to democratize its political system. The key question then was, what to do with Islam in this new secular nation's republic? What is the proper place for Islam? And the answers varied, but uh, soon we can see emerging a dual deadlock. Uh, one was, it is this nation's religion, so because the nation is valuable, its religion must be valuable too. The other was, uh, it is somehow this nation's religion, uh, but it's not the most important part of it, so uh, we have to find a limited place for that. Its perils for the life and the future of nation can be contained. And the participation in this debate was national, and the reference eventually became nationalism. So uh, because of the uh, far from clear equation, uh, between nation and Muslim, or, or let's say nation and Islam, or Turks and Muslims, uh, Islam could not be um, swept away altogether. Uh, and the nationalist thought and nationalist politics became some kind of uh, um, an authority of arbitration in this issue. This uh, first generation of debate is alive. It's not that it continued but now we have a second generation emerging beside it. And it emerged in the 90s. If I may uh, refer to uh, Ahmed's presentation, uh, he spoke about uh, polarization in the 90s. This is very closely related to those uh, developments. And then the key question was a different one. Uh, in, in, in that context of polarization, the question was, How can we protect civil rights for everybody in a democracy under the rule of law? So now the stress uh, is slightly changed because we are not now discussing about uh, institutions like uh, majority religion versus nation and state, but now we are discussing individuals, their rights and their plural interests and their equal rights and freedoms. so this is uh, this is the reason that we can call it uh, as a, a second generation of debate. So uh, let me briefly compare them. Uh, scholars of constitutional law involved in the first generation, uh, you can see Professor Bashkil uh, and Professor Essen, uh, which were uh, outstanding figures in their times. Uh, and uh, there were two competing approaches which we can uh, clearly identify. One of them, let me call it freedom to religion approach. We all know that when we are talking about freedom of religion, uh, we are actually talking about two complementary dimensions. One is our freedom to religion and the other is our freedom from religion. We we, we have rights Uh, related to freedom from religion we don't want and freedom to religion we want. So in this complementary um, integrity of freedom of religion, these parties apparently chose to uh, put the focus on either side and not to understand it as a whole. Uh, They mostly tried to ignore to the extent they could do uh, the other dimension, uh, Bashkil and his followers were freedom to religion party and uh, Essen and his comrades were uh, the freedom from religion party, uh, if I may say. And uh, 
Bashkilan followers had a serious impact on right-wing politicians and right-wing politicians because they were successful in electoral politics. Uh, their impact uh, happened to go that way. And they also had an impact on 1980 COP uh, military uh, political reason. So Bashkil effect, we can follow it that way. How about SN effect? They were very... Uh, F um, Okay. They were influential on judges. So the courts bought the freedom from religion approach mostly, uh, which happened to uh, come like uh, freedom of religion is not a constitutional value independent uh, and valuable by itself, but it's a derivative of the principle of secularism. How about the second generation? Now we see a variety of approaches and scholars in the study of constitutional law. And now we can see subjective rights introduced into the debate, uh, but this is not very well established yet. Uh, let me pass this because we have seen this. The argument for freedom to religion was uh, very similar to what Locke had done once. Uh, and the argument for freedom from religion was very similar to what Spinoza had done once. Uh, but one thing is clear, in both parties, when they, are, they were speaking about religion, mostly and often only meant Islam. Uh, and this happens in the same way when we look at the course decisions. When they're talking about religion, they mean Islam. Uh, but with the second generation, we see several things change on the uh, table. Old questions are revisit, revisited and revised, but we have now new questions. Uh, what do I mean by pluralization? The first thing about it is uh, beliefs other than Islam gain significant significance. And uh, the second issue is, uh, apart from institutions, uh, political principles, or abstract political things, uh, individuals and their rights and their freedoms, demands and interests, uh, came into play now. And uh, because of all of the, these, uh, Principles like, uh, you, as you can see, human rights and democracy and rule of law gain significance uh, besides secularism. But the jurisprudential repercussions uh, of the second generation is far from being very significant today because we can say it's at an early stage. Uh, we have several good examples of uh, taking subjective rights seriously, but it is not systematic and we cannot see a pattern of uh, jurisprudence over that. It's like kind of conti contingent, but for the future it cannot be contingent. Why? Uh, I, lo looking at all the th uh, things on the table, I can say the second generation of uh, debate will prevail over the first. Uh, what do I mean by that? It will, I think, include and transform it and go beyond it. Uh, at least for one technical reason. Uh, because of uh, the mm, mandate of the constitutional court, it could uh, judge on cases re relating to freedom of religion uh, without seriously involving in an analysis of subjective rights in the matter. But it's no more possible because since 2010, we now have uh, an individual complaint procedure. So in an individual complaint procedure, the, cause ha the court has to rely on a rights understanding because now you are, uh, I mean, th these are rights cases, so you can uh, go on with your uh, old school institutional analysis. Uh, if, if only this uh, could, uh, let me say, the second generation understanding will prevail, yes, I could uh, say that. We have hard questions for future, and again, these questions uh, need the second generation approach and not the first one. Uh, 
I think I'm uh, at zero minutes now. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you so much. Okay, so next uh, we have Dr. George Garvilis from the Holling Center as our discussant, and we are privileged to be joined by him uh, as a discussant. Uh, he's the executive director of uh, Holling Center for International Dialogue here in D.C. Uh, he concurrently a senior research scholar at Columbia University in New York. Uh, his research is in the fields of border management, international assistance to post-conflict states and politics and economy of the Middle East, with also a focus on Turkey. Uh, and he has held several research uh, and teaching positions before, including U Texas Austin, Harvard University, uh, Columbia, and many others. Dr. Carlos, thank you so much. Please. Thank you. I, I appreciate it. I thought you would only say my name, and that would be it, but got more than I bargained for. Uh, it's, uh, it's a real honor to be here, and it's also rather nice because uh, while I'm at the Hulling Center and we, we are involved deeply in Turkey all the time, what these papers did uh, was to, to force me to really think about Turkey as I had experienced it for the first time uh, back in the 1990s and to doubly think about how incredibly transformed the country is, if you think about the 1990s versus now, let alone some of the previous periods that your papers touch on, the 1940s, the 1920s, the, the pre-Republic Ottoman period, and so on. Um, <clears throat> having said that, the other rather nice thing about this panel is that this is DC, and we are very much a foreign policy-minded crowd, and so it was also very nice to get this really nice and coherent collection of papers about the role of public elites, public intellectuals, and their uh, role in social transformation in the country. The, the papers do a really nice job of fitting together on this panel, and I'm very happy to have had a chance to read them. I know you listen to each other's presentations, but I don't know if you had a chance to read each other's papers, and so, one of the things that I want to do in my comments is not only ask some questions about the papers and their broader context, but also compare them to one another, because I found that very fascinating for myself. Um, we, we had, uh, I'm actually going to go in, not in the order that they were presented, but rather in the order uh, that they struck me in terms of the ability of intellectuals to affect changes. And I thought that in terms of uh, th the paper that was most ambitious or most, let's say, positive on the ability of public intellectuals or elites to actually forge ahead with critical debates was Hassan's. Uh, and then the second paper in that respect was Ahmed. And then the, the third paper, the one that I thought expressed uh, the most skepticism in terms of leadership's ability to change was Doan's paper because Doan's paper was more about leadership reacting to the reality uh, of broader politics. Um, and I found that very interesting, and if you have a chance to read these papers, I'd be curious very much to have your impressions on these. Having said that, the, the other reason why I particularly enjoyed these papers is because they made me think not only of Turkey, broadly speaking, and Turkey's domestic debates and domestic politics, but they made me think broadly about these intellectual debates in other fields and for other countries. And as I read these papers, I thought of some, um, a number of academics that have grappled with really difficult issues of the role of public intellectuals or elites. I thought, what would Charles Tilley say if he were still here with us today and he read your papers? Uh, would he agree with you? Would he disagree with you? Because Charles Tilley always believed that it wasn't so much uh, elites or intellectuals that transformed society, but rather it was people and society uh, itself that led the transformation and that elites kind of reflected that curve. Uh, that they were not so much one step ahead, but they were trying to march to the beat of society as much as possible. And then there were uh, a number of other people that came to mind, some of them sociologists that aren't as well known, like Joanne Swidler. Joanne Swidler back in the 1980s and the 90s worked on on a really interesting issue, she looked at ideology 
and the role of elites and people to shape or to break with ideology. And she had a very interesting theory about whether it was in difficult times or in stable times that you can change ideology and break with the past. And so I'm not necessarily saying that you should engage with these debates, but I'm simply praising your papers for making me think even more broadly than your papers. And I thought that this was wonderful and it reflected how nicely the panel uh, was set together. Um, Hassan, one of the questions that I, I would like to ask you in particular, and again, this is me thinking more, more broadly because of, of uh, the nice qualities in your paper. Um, one of the, th your paper makes a really great case for these two major streams of debate and change in Turkey, um, the, the 1940s and the 80s, 90s. <clears throat> and you make a case about how the second debate seems to be more vibrant, more representative, and perhaps stronger. Um, and in turn, you make a case for how elites are perhaps making more strides in this period. When I read the paper, and, and this is quite strange on my part, I thought about an article I had read once on India by Suzanne and Lloyd Rudolph, who are political scientists at uh, the University of Chicago. And back in the 1990s, this was the early 90s, it was the end of the Cold War, uh, a lot of societies were going through radical periods of political transformation, and we know that we had conflict in a lot of the world to deal with. Remember, the Civil War was raging in Yugoslavia, there was all sorts of communal conflict in India. And they wrote this really interesting paper called Ancient Hatreds. The paper was about India in the wake of the Ayodhya religious riots where, where Hindus dismantled a mosque. Many of you may remember that. Uh, it was quite a harrowing episode and one that led to tremendous conflict and death. And one of the things that journalists were putting out at the time was the idea that these conflicts were stoked by hatreds that were very historical and very deep. And elites were able to call on these ancient hatreds and get people to take up arms. One of the things that the Rudolphs argued very eloquently in their piece, because they were, after all, experts and deep scholars of India who had spent decades of their lives there studying the country. One of the things that they noted was that society and everyday people in India were often ahead of their elites and their intellectuals because they were able to coexist and live together as Hindus and Muslims and to come up with ways to do so and not only to tolerate each other but to take part in each other's ceremonies in a way that even intellectuals or let's say political leaders at the time couldn't conceive. And so the case they made was that simply said society is often ahead of its intellectuals. Um, so the point that I, I do wanna press you on is how vibrant is the second debate really? And what has been left out? Ahmed, I'm gonna turn to, to you next because uh, um, of the dynamic that I identified. In your paper, you, I, I thought that uh, in your presentation you made a very nice leap because you actually went further than you did in your paper in a number of things. But in the paper you also mentioned towards the end a series of sectors, uh, religion, women's issues, citizenship issues, Kurdish TV for example. Uh, and you, you mentioned these things, but you didn't go into many details. And so the thing that I wanted to ask you was, when it comes to public intellectuals, the public intellectuals that you talk about and their ability for social transformation, in we, which of these sectors do you think we've seen the most change? And in which of these do you think we've seen the least impact of public intellectuals? Uh, the your paper is a very nice survey and quite a concise one at that of 10 years and, and more actually of JHP history. Um, and I bring you up last simply because your paper, like I said, seems to be implicitly the most skeptical in terms of human agency or elite agency to change things. And the paper tells a, a very nice tale as I read it 
of the JHP having to strate strategically recalibrate its tactics and its leadership recalibrate its tactics to broader democratization changes as well as the loss of these tutelary institutions that you talk about or the weakening of certain Republican institutions that were traditionally the bulwarks of the party. So my question to you is one that looks forward. And you, you said a couple things here, but I want you to look five years ahead. I would like you to tell me what will the JHP look like in the next five years? You gave us a couple scenarios of either or, but I want you to tell me which one you would bet your money on and why. This is, after all, a DC audience that wants easy answers. And let me turn that question around, because in a sense it's the toughest question, and let me ask it of all of you three. When it comes to the people and the dynamics and the debates that you've identified, could you tell me what Turkey might look like in five years in terms of your cast of characters? And let me thank you in advance for your answers to these admittedly difficult questions, and I'm glad I'm the one asking them, not having to answer them. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Garvelis. Uh, okay, so now let's do this. So for the questions from the audience, we'll ask you to kindly line up before, behind the two mics on two ends of the room, uh, and please keep your uh, questions concise. But before that, I'd like to give about two minutes to each of you. I know that's not enough uh, to address Dr. Garvelis' questions briefly before we field the questions from, uh, from the hall. Um, you can go as you wish. Uh, Ahmed, do you want to go first? Is it open? Yes. Yeah. So, uh, for your question, which sectors uh, most change and which sectors most influence? I would say uh, society and state. So, it started from society, this transformation already started from society. It still continues, it's, uh, it didn't end as well. And uh, it's affecting the state and all state institutions. And maybe the uh, election system or the other, uh, just like, uh, it, can, it can go to uh, some kind of uh, system that is uh, more democratic, but this is still in the process, I would say. So clearly, start from society and it continues with the state. Secondly, uh, for uh, what Turkey look like, uh, will look like in five years, I think uh, Turkey will be uh, more democratic in five years and uh, many minority groups or religious groups will find a place in the state institutions. And maybe a uh, state uh, can uh, form according to the expectations of the regions as well, not only Turkey, uh, also the regions, Middle East, Balkans, or Caucasus. So state can be formed according to the expectations in the region, I think. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, Sam, would you like to go? Um, uh, I could briefly say uh, several things. Um, uh, I think last year, uh, SETA in Ankara published a, a very uh, good uh, work on uh, constitutional amendment proposals that have been uh, uh, shared with the public since uh, the 80s. Uh, they were all uh, in a compared fashion, article by article. Uh, and uh, when we look at the article uh, 24 uh, about freedom of religion, uh, the proposals were quite alike. I mean, uh, it was the welfare party, the communist party, um, the right-wing parties, left-wing parties, nationalist parties, and there were about 20 different proposals uh, from different times. Uh, but uh, most of them were mostly very alike. Uh, two were really different. Uh, one was the Özbudun proposal as we know it. Uh, I mean, the prime minister asked him to prepare and with his team he had prepared something. I think it was in 
2007. That was different, and the whole others were the same. What was different, what was the same? Um, the Article 24 is um, like the previous Constitution's uh, formulation, and it is different from the International Instruments of Human Law. It has technical difficulties, uh, and it cannot be really applied, uh, but it it, this is not a problem because it is not really applied. Uh, but uh, the Özbudun uh, formulation was similar to the formulation in the European Convention of Human Rights. And now we know that the committee working on the new constitution's articles has agreed on some formulation which is parallel to Özbudun's. So despite the fact that the majority of the political reason on freedom of religion goes this way, uh, today uh, the new constitution uh, being prepared is going the other way. Uh, the political elite, at least, uh, are not uh, ahead of the society, I guess. But let's let me say it this way. Uh, we don't, we don't need all of them to be ahead of the society. If we have an influential part uh, leading the uh, developments, uh, then it will work. Uh, the second uh, generation, how vibrant, you ask? Not really very vibrant, uh, especially when it comes to constitutional law, which is my professional uh, field of interest. Uh, it is not really vibrant, but when we come to human rights law, or when we come to normative political theory studies, it is vibrant then. And uh, now because of the recent constitutional uh, complaint uh, procedure, I expect it will be really vibrant in the next five years. And I hope so. Thank you so much. And Doan? That's a very difficult question to answer in two minutes. So. I know. But, uh, but let me focus on the transformative role of party leadership um, over the party organization. Um, transformation is the key um, term, I think, it has been uh, in Turkish politics over the past decade. Um, following the Republican People's Party's reestablishment in 1992 um, and peripheral challenges. Kurdish nationalism, Islamist politics, um, to, to the political center, uh, created a type of Republican that is allergic to many of these terms, even to, to, to public debate. So what kind of secularism should the Republic have? How should we define it? Should people be able to defend themselves in the court of law, in their native languages? It is one thing to, to have these discussions and conclude them either way or to altogether reject um, talking about these issues. This is what the Republicans did um, for the good part of the past two decades. Um, currently, the, 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 my hope for the next five years is that we'll be able to talk about things. And I think we're getting there in that sense. And I, I was not aware that I sounded that pessimistic about agency. Um, a recent party congress uh, decided to automatically share 40% of all party resources with the peripheral organization, which means um, this will promote um, more peripheral actors having, having a say in, in, in central decision, decisions um, within the party organization. Um, I think the crucial crucial point in the next five years will be the elections. Turkey will hold um, presidential elections, local elections, and parliamentary elections. And honestly, barely anyone has any clue how that's gonna turn out. At the same time, we ha we're drafting a new constitution where does, there does not necessarily seem to be a, a consensus on many issues, including how to define citizenship, whether it should have an ethnic component or whether it should be a civic um, version of, um, of citizenship. 
Um, I think elections represent both a challenge and an opportunity. It's a challenge in the sense that you don't want to risk losing voters. So it's the fundamental calculation is do most of my voters um, prefer a nationalist party or a, a, ten, a party that, that tends toward nationalism uh, and you know, these um, non-discussions, uh, in which case you will, you will um, determine your, your candidates based on that. Um, what I hope it will be a leverage in the sense that uh, a strong performance in the upcoming elections would give the new, new leadership um, some credit to use um, toward change efforts and further democratization. Thank you so much. Uh, okay, so now the Q&A session, and as always, we don't uh, have too much time for that, but we have a good 15 minutes or so because we want to wrap up a bit earlier so that we can prepare the room and everyone has uh, some time to get some fresh air before the keynote address by Kemal Darvish starts. Uh, if you have questions, please kindly uh, proceed to the, uh, to the mics on either end of the room. And kindly, please also identify yourself, your name and your affiliation. Uh, and more importantly, please do keep your comments and questions uh, concise. Thank you. Hi, I'm uh, Ravza Kavakchikan, a PhD candidate at Howard University in Washington, D.C. Um, I wanted to take off from where Dr. Gavranilis left off and ask all of you about the headscarf issue. Uh, we know that as far as uh, university students are concerned, the ban has been lifted at certain places, but where do you see it from your, with respect to your perspective? Where do you see it constitutionally? Where, where do you see the elite? Uh, in five years, and uh, where do you see uh, JHP in five years? What kind of attitude will they take uh, since it's still going on and we still don't have any university professors with headscarf? Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Let's take another question before, or, or you know, a few questions before the panel can uh, answer. Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, Armen Sahak, a research associate from the European Institute. Uh, my question would be probably mostly geared towards Hassan because you are an expert in constitutional law. Um, since the 1980s, Turkey has come a long way in terms of journalist, uh, journalist freedom. Um, today, there's, it's much better than it was during the coup in the 80s. Uh, but there seems to be a lot of problems hindering, uh, especially the code, the Article 301 in the code about insulting Turkishness, if I'm not mistaken. Um, how do you assess the importance of this article, and do you see it being changed during the constitutional amendments or the new drafting of the Constitution? Thanks. Thank you. Okay, so I will kindly ask you to, to wait a few minutes. Okay, uh, please, sponsors. So we have two excellent questions uh, in both content and length. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, th thank you for uh, both questions. Uh, I, I will be trying to be brief. Uh, constitutionally, how uh, can we uh, describe the headscarf issue? Um, you know, this is law, and law can be interpreted in several ways, and they are uh, competing interpretations. And uh, when we see a, a court with the authority uh, to say the final uh, word uh, as to the law, then that, that becomes the law of the land, but that does not become the, the best interpretation of the law, of course. Uh, interestingly, the Turkish Constitution Court interpreted the Constitution, let me say stubbornly, uh, in a way that uh, an increasing many uh, of the scholars of constitutional law disagree with. But the disagreement itself uh, did not uh, mm, last long. When we look at the examples of the honorable late um, Professor Bülent Taner, he first disagreed the position of the court, but after years he came closer and closer and closer. So uh, in the field of constitutional law in Turkey, if uh, uh, jurisprudence prevails, then we can see scholars coming closer and closer and closer. Uh, the headscarf ban, according to the constitutional court, emerges directly from the constitution itself. Uh, this is reasonably challengeable, uh, and nothing changed in this aspect, but when the prime minister 
uh, ha- held a meeting with university uh, ha- heads and requested kindly that they should not continue this ban anymore. The ban on universities disappears. The law is not changing, but the ban disappears. Now, the law is the same. So what about the constitutional court jurisprudence? Uh, well, the members of the court has changed. So in the next case before the court, maybe we can get another interpretation of the same constitutional formulations. Uh, but as of now, law is not changed, but the prime minister has requested. Thank you. Thank you. Any others who would like uh, to address the same question? Uh, I'm sorry. And there Please. is this freedom of expression issue. Uh, le- let me say briefly that um, when uh, human rights activists complained about uh, these respecting formulations, especially in the penal law, uh, Often it is uh, Mr. Cemil Cicek who would say that this is not unusual. This is a kind of regulation that you can see in all advanced democracies. This is not particularly Turkish way of um, penalizing harmful speech. Uh, And he brings us uh, examples from European democracies that uh, punish uh, let's say racist speech, so on and so forth. But what is the difference? Uh, one is the vagueness of the formulation, and the second is the judges who interpret that law. Turkish judges are great when it comes to interpreting law uh, to the fullest extent you can restrict freedom. So we, I think we should uh, reformulate uh, the mm, law but not stop there and uh, I I don't think it's a matter of constitutional law uh, first but uh, it's mostly a matter of penal law reform with reference to international human rights standards and some kind of uh, renewal in the understanding of the judges I think thank you thank you yeah please briefly if you go (laughs) so if I uh, look the uh, headscarf issue on social transformation. So uh, we saw in the first years of uh, first years of 2000, uh, there was a fear in uh, JHP supporters or uh, Kemalist people, mainly maybe Turkey can be in Sharia. However, these fears are reduced step by step, and now there is no a kind of uh, fear because. Uh, Recep Tayyip Erdogan as well said secularism is the best system. So there is no a kind of fear. So I think uh, it started now at universities that that ban is uh, removed. Maybe uh, later it can continue with the uh, state institutions and officials. And then maybe later on uh, it can affect the whole uh, institution in state. So it's step by step happening. But uh, if we analyze now, headscraft, uh, the women who use headscraft is reducing. So th- uh, there was an increase after 2008 February process because of they felt a kind of protection of their uh, headscraft or religion. But now because everywhere is free, uh, there is no a kind of uh, protection of headscraft or religion. Thank you. John, you can. Yeah. Uh, okay. Thank you for your patience. Please. Yeah. This question is for Ahmed um, Jordan. Um, I was pleased that um, you mentioned a movement back to multi-ethnic Ottoman social structure, but your examples. Um, maybe you didn't have time, but the examples of Armenian television programs and Kurdish language seemed slight to me. I work with Turkish communities in the Balkans where Ottoman social structure has more substance. Um, Perhaps you want to add to this? Hi, my name is Ina. um, I work for US government. I have a question for all of you, somewhat of a broad question. 
What are the main drivers of the democratization process in Turkey? Thank you. Uh, thank you. Um, Doğan, would you like to address perhaps the second question and then we can go back to Ahmed for the particular question? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Let me first address the, the previous question that I uh, on the CHP's take on the health care issue. I think there are two competing narratives. One is, one tends to securitize the issue, um, as in the late 90s and till the mid 2000s, that perceives a threat, warranted or not, and chooses to exclude people from public service in other areas, if necessary, to protect state interests, perceived state interests. The second, um, approach focuses on citizenship and equal entitlement, be it language reforms, um, headscarf, any issue, and uh, fo focuses on a revis revision of the political regime along popular interests, which is in necessarily uh, a, a, an order that would include people rather than exclude people. Um, regarding the democratization issue, um, I think definitely the um, EU pr um, admission process has been uh, has been definitely very influential. Uh, whether or not Turkey will uh, be eventually admitted into EU, that's a whole different question. But I think um, the whole membership negotiation process has offered Turkey a roadmap um, to improve on its um, on its track record in human rights, liberties, democracy. Um, definitely another um, very um, important driving force was the fact that the Justice and Development Party was a peripheral actor. Um, the Welfare Party was ousted from power from, from by the military. And in that sense, the, the Islamist tradition was not welcome in the political center, which is sometimes what it takes to transform things. And I would say definitely that um, a third, um, more longer term factor was the overall promotion of democracy globally um, after the Cold War um, in the sense that Turkey, a very connected um, global player, um, felt the need to, to address these issues as they tend to become burdens after a while. Uh, Hassan Ahmed, if you would like to. On the second question first, and then we'll go back to Ahmed for, or do you want to address the first question? No, no, it's yes. Yeah, please. So uh, when I talk about the social transformation, I mean uh, it still continued, uh, it didn't end. So uh, these uh, Kurdish TV channels or Armenian programs are just starting uh, of the transformation in the state institutions. So uh, in transformation issue, there is an interaction between people and public intellectuals, also state. So many people in Turkey has a fear, maybe Turkey uh, will be divided uh, because of uh, Kurdish rebellion or because of Armenian uh, groups in Armenia or something like that. So state is uh, first of all convincing that people, Turkey will not be divided. So this is taking some time and uh, step by step it continues like uh, people are convinced and the uh, state is uh, formed according to these ideas uh, in terms of the diaspora perspective on uh, Ottomanism issue for instance. Uh, Turkish uh, diaspora is not uh, now a kind of ethnic Turkism, is not based on ethnic Turkism now, it is uh, connecting with uh, other Ottoman nations as well. For example, there were many people migrated to, to Latin America in Ottoman time. So Turkey is now connecting with that people uh, because uh, they are saying uh, they came from same uh, land, same uh, state in Ottoman Empire. So they know, say they have same values and they share same values with the Turkish people in Turkey as well. So they uh, can be uh, understood as a, a kind of citizen of Turkey, like future citizen, or they were past citizens, and they can be future citizens of Turkey or diaspora in uh, abroad as well. Thank you. Thank you.
Yeah, so, and then we'll have Dr. Gar with this, uh, perhaps address some of our questions um, and some final comments. Yeah. Uh, I'm sorry, I don't have a specific and brief uh, answer about democratization in Turkey, but I can I can use my opportunity to add one more point to the health scarf issue. Uh, uh, there is a recent uh, court decision on the health scarf issue, uh, as several of us would know here. Uh, the Council of State, which is the highest level court in administrative law, uh, has recently decided that the National Bar of Lawyers regulation, uh, which uh, result in a ban on health scarf, uh, is, uh, uh, has to be annulled because lawyers are not civil servants, so uh, restrictions applicable to civil servants would not be applicable to lawyers. Uh, this uh, brings in two results. One, uh, health scars cannot be prohibited for lawyers in courts. Two, consequently and Im Im inherently, we can understand that uh, it can be prohibited for civil servants other than lawyers. Thank you. So much. Uh, okay. So, Dr. Gavilis, if you care to give us some final comments and either of questions and some more contextualization, it was very helpful. Sure. I, there's there's really no need for me to add to your great questions, but I, I simply want to thank our young scholars for preparing these papers and thank you for giving me an opportunity and to thank SETA for kicking off a great event and I'm looking forward to the other panels. Thank you. Right. Okay. Thank you so much. Uh, so this brings us to the end of a great panel. Thank you so much for being here and please join me in thanking the panel. Uh, okay, and we'll start sharp at 12 uh, noon uh, with the keynote address and in the meantime, please feel free um, to wander around and interact with the uh, panelists as well. <laughs>